Good morning and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to please switch off or turn to silent your devices? Item 1 is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items 4, 5, 6 in private this morning? Thank you. Item 2 is the Section 22 report, the 2018 audit of the Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Stephen Boyle, Audit Director, and Pauline Gillan, Audit Manager, Audit Services, all from Audit Scotland. I understand the Auditor General would like to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener. As the Committee knows, the Scottish Government's annual consolidated accounts are a critical component of its accountability to Parliament and the public. The current challenging and increasingly complex financial environment and the uncertainty from the European withdrawal highlight the importance of comprehensive, clear and consistent financial reporting to support this Committee and the wider Parliament in its scrutiny role. The consolidated accounts cover around 84% of the spending approved by Parliament in 2018-19, the elements that the Government is directly responsible for. They show the amounts it spent against each main budget heading and the reasons for any significant differences. They also show the assets, liabilities and other financial commitments of the Scottish Government carried forward to future years. My independent opinion on the consolidated accounts is unqualified. This means I'm confident that they provide a true and fair view of the government's finances and they meet legal and accounting requirements. Convener, I would like to highlight three areas in my report briefly. First of all, financial management. The Scottish Government managed its budget for 2018-19 within the overall limits set by Parliament and budget management during the year was effective in managing aggregate spending, borrowing and tax receipts within this limit. The accounts show that total net expenditure during 2018-19 was £36.137 billion, £778 million less than the budget. My report highlights the status of government loans and guarantees to private companies such as Ferguson Marine, Bifab and Presswick Airport, where the valuations of financial support have declined significantly. The Government has not yet implemented my recommendation from last year to develop a framework to clearly outline its approach to providing this sort of financial support to private companies. Such a framework should provide clear information on financial capacity, risk tolerance and the expected outcomes to provide Parliament and the public with better information about the Government's objectives in entering these agreements. Secondly, financial reporting. Last year I welcomed the Government's publication of its first medium-term financial strategy. The Government published its second strategy in May this year. The new strategy now does include principles and policies on reserves and borrowing powers, which is welcome, but it does not reflect some basic components of a medium-term financial plan that were included in 2018. In addition, the Government has still not fulfilled its commitment to this committee to publish a consolidated account covering the whole devolved public sector in Scotland. This would fill an important gap, providing information about the impact of past decisions on future budgets, the scale of assets and liabilities, and potential risk to financial sustainability. Finally, convener, the performance report included in the consolidated accounts complies with the principles of the Government reporting requirements and the accounts direction. However, as in previous years, it provides only very limited performance information on the government's own progress towards its overall aims and objectives, with users of the accounts directed to the national performance framework. There is a need for the government to prepare a performance report that clearly links to the financial resources outlined in the consolidated accounts. As ever, we'll do our best to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. We intend to cover all those issues. That committee, first of all, is particularly concerned about the lack of a framework on the loans and grants to private companies, and I'm going to ask Alec Neil to open up questioning on that point. Yeah, hey, good morning, Auditor General. Um, I think uh, <coughs> clearly you raise a very important issue about the need for a framework for deciding which organisations and companies uh, receive assistance, uh, what's the criteria for that assistance, uh, what's the process for that assistance, and why do some receive nothing? such as St Rollick's, and why do others receive a lot of money, and that, that's from, on the face of it justifiably, but what is the criteria and wh what needs to now happen to make sure that this is properly governed? I should start by saying that we are 
confident that the individual decisions are properly governed in terms of the due diligence being carried out at the point in which a decision is made. What, I, what is not in place and what I rec recommended last year is a framework which gives exactly the sort of um, context in which those choices are made. We all understand that government will look from time to time to support companies to safeguard jobs um, and perhaps to give companies more time to um, gain financial support um, on the capital markets. Um, but there are always more of those sorts of calls than there will be funding available for them. Um, they are inherently uh, political choices that any government will have to make and they do bring with them risks as we've seen in the consolidated account this year um, with the value of the uh, loans and guarantees being written down quite significantly substantially. So what I'm calling for is the government to set out a framework which uh, provides Parliament and the wider public with information about uh, the risk appetite, appetite it has, the overall um, amount of uh, capacity for providing financial support that's available, and how it goes about making those trade-offs, both so that we can see why this company and not that company, and so that Parliament can be sure that um, the government is not investing in declining industries at the expense of industries that may have a longer-term future. Can I pick up particularly two points? You mentioned due diligence and jobs, and pick the example of Ferguson Marine. Now, the government itself made a statement when it made a bid to, to the administrator for uh, made an offer to take over Ferguson Marine. And they said that they had not done any financial estimates of the cost to the public purse of doing so. So surely that indicates there hasn't been proper due diligence. And it seems to me, for example, no estimates were given of the additional working capital that will need to be met by the taxpayer. Uh, due diligence in terms of the ability of the yard to finish, technically, to finish these two ships. And secondly, on jobs. Uh, given the 20% rule, whereby a publicly owned shipyard must have no more than 20% of its turnover from the state sector in terms of orders, then the potential loss of potential jobs means that that yard cannot compete for international work, which the yard can, could have done previously and had an estimate of creating up to a total of 1,000 jobs compared to the 300-odd jobs that will be protected under the new nationalised arrangement. So both in terms of due diligence and in terms of jobs, has the right decision been made? My reference to due diligence was about the um, guarantees and support that are covered by these accounts, um, which includes the Ferguson Marine 45 million up to the point of the balance sheet date, rather than decisions about potential nationalisation taken after that. Um, and we're confident that uh, the decisions to provide support to Ferguson Marine, Bifab, Presswick and Loch Arbor all were subject to, to due diligence. Um, as I say in my report, um, I. I expect that either I or my successor will want to look at the decision to nationalise Ferguson Marine once that um, has been fully worked through. Stephen, I think, can tell you a little bit more about what we've seen about the process so far. Stephen. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning. Um, the Auditor General, as she outlines, in terms of our work in assessing the due diligence, was focused around um, the loans and guarantees that the government has provided to Ferguson and the other public bodies that, that they took appropriate legal and financial advice from suitably qualified experts to assess the risks um, that they were entering into. Um, in that regard, you know, we're satisfied that, that um, the decision points taken to support these industries at the point of offering the loans and guarantees had gone through proper processes. The decision point latterly in terms of what the future obligations is something that, as well as the Auditor General returning to through future reporting to the committee, is also something we'll continue to track. Uh, in terms of both the audit of the Scottish Government, but I think also some of the other public bodies that are, that are more closely uh, connected, Transport Scotland, for example. But is there not a need for a more urgent review of the whole Ferguson Marine process? I mean, is it not true that CMAL, which is separate from CalMac, uh, ordered ships that CalMac did not ask for, and CMAL decided they were going to get anyway, in terms of the new technology that's proved extremely difficult and caused all the problems. So why is CMAL and CalMac still separate? Why did the CMAL order ships that CalMac didn't ask for? Uh, why did the government go in without estimating the total cost to the taxpayer of their bid? Uh, 
And why are we engaged in a, a solution that puts at risk the potential job creation that otherwise would be there? I mean, I think these are legitimate questions that require fairly urgent responses. Um, certainly, in, in, in terms of the, you know, the scope of, of these accounts, um, as, you, as you know, Mr Neil, that CMAL is not covered by the audit. Um, it's now in terms of where we go from here, because clearly um, there are a number of issues you raise quite rightly, and what I'm saying is the implications of what you're saying about the need to be very clear what we're doing when we're taking <coughs> over a company or buying into a company or not buying into a company as we refuse to do at St Rolics for, I think, understandable reasons. Uh, but you know, you're saying quite rightly there needs to be a framework. Surely these issues all have to be part of that framework. So we understand, uh, in terms of the um, the lead up to the decision point around around nationalisation, the Scottish government has kept us fully briefed and informed, and which we welcome. I think you know, I can see a, a, a clear um, improvement and move on from the level of communication that, that we had in previous years. Um, the decision point to nationalise and uh, recognising that you know, your interest lies beyond these accounts happened after the date that these accounts were approved. As for our purposes and, and recognising the report that we do today is to signal our intention to come back to the committee um, through the Auditor General for reporting on the circumstances leading to the nationalisation um, of Ferguson. What we would say and understand is that the, um, the government's commitment is around completing, the, the as it signalled, the, the two remaining ferries um, that Ferguson was undertaking uh, on behalf of CMAL. And I think it's something that further reporting to the committee on, on more detailed circumstances um, is our intention uh, during 2020. OK, because I'm linking this to the recommendation for a framework. And it seems to me, I mean, I'm told that technically it'll be very difficult to complete these ships without possibly another £50 million pounds of taxpayers' money being used because of the spec, and which is one of the reasons I understand that CalMac didn't ask for these ferries, because they're too uh, complicated and too complex in terms of what they needed, and they needed these urgently, as we see from the problem with the Aran ferry last week. And it seems to be this is quite an urgent issue in terms of ferries policy. Those are questions that we'll look to answer in the further piece of work that we've referred to. I think it's important, though, to be clear that we don't have the powers to stop government from doing something. So government will make its own decisions and we will review those Absolutely. decisions and report to Parliament. Yeah. But, but I think it highlights the need for a framework. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I'd like to probe this issue about the framework a little bit further, um, if I may. Uh, Stephen Boyle, you said that... I think the government took advice from suitably qualified experts on whether to grant these sums of money or not. Can you tell us who these experts are? So, um, certainly, you know, the, the government uses a range of typically um, external legal advice um, and um, financial experts, most usually from the big four accountancy firms uh, uh, and, and other large accountancy firms who provide uh, experts in terms of the... Um, Anticipated costing, cash flow projections, and so forth. We can, I can give you the detail of which uh, experts have been involved in which contracts in writing. Okay. Can you just remind us, for the record, who the big four are? Of course, they are comprised of EY, PwC, Deloitte, and KPMG. Okay. Because there was a situation <coughs> quite recently that I raised um, in the chamber, where KPMG were the government advisors and uh, McGill Electrical, um, a company based in Dundee but employing 470 people across Scotland, were looking for um, a, a loan, not a grant, from the Scottish Government of £2 million to keep the company afloat and the 470 jobs. Now, that loan was refused by the Government. KPMG were the Government advisors. But after that decision was made, the next day, KPMG became the liquidators, the administrators, with the huge fee that administration brings. Do you think there's a conflict of interest there? It's, it's potentially difficult for me to comment on the circumstances um, of that individual case convener. Um, and it's one I would assume that you know all, 
auditors and, you know, and those professional qualifications are, are bound by appropriate ethical standards. But in terms of the circumstance in there, it's, it's maybe not one for me okay, to Okay, well, let me state. separate it slightly from the particulars of that case, because it really <laughs> concerned me that you have a situation in Scotland where companies, and in this current economic climate, we've seen several companies, as we've talked about already this morning, come to the Scottish Government to look for assistance to save jobs. The Scottish Government are taking advice from independent experts, and you named them, one of them being KPMG. But then when the government makes a decision not to give that money, that independent expert then benefits financially from that decision by becoming administrator. Auditor General, do you think there's an issue there? I understand the concern, convener. Um, I think it's a question for government about what conditions it places on the appointment of the advisers that it's using in cases like this. Um, and then, as Stephen said, a question around the um, independence and ethical standards which are in play for accountants acting in that role. There are strong um, independence and ethical requirements for auditors. I'm not an expert on how they apply in advisory and um, administrator liquidation roles. Um, but I think it's an appropriate question to ask government. We have a situation in Scotland where we want to see construction. There are problems in the construction industry, but I am told by experts that the big four and other accountancy firms are circling like vultures around these construction companies because they are operating on such tight margins. So is it then ethical for the Scottish Government, knowing that that is the case, to, to trust their independent expertise? As I've said, I think there is an entirely proper question to government to ask them what conditions it places on the, condi the contracts when it engages a firm to provide it with advice about uh, support, whether that's loans, grants or guarantees to a company. Um, it, would be, it would be possible to put in place restrictions that said if you provide advice here, then you are precluded from acting as the administrator. I don't know whether government does that. I think that's an appropriate question to ask government. Okay. Let me um, probe a little bit further on Mr Neil's question on jobs, because I was incensed by this situation because of the number of jobs involved and the relatively small amount of money requested. Now, I understand the company's got to be looked at and you know decisions are made and you talked about due diligence. But then I, I was very aware of the contrasting situation down in Inverclyde, where Texas Instruments was giving, I think, £15 million by the government for far fewer jobs. I think it was 150 jobs. So is there, you said there is no framework. Are you aware of any kind of government guidance that, um, that tallies the number of jobs with potential government investment? Or is that irrelevant in these decisions? I, I don't think it's irrelevant at all. There is guidance um, alongside the financial reporting man manual recently introduced for the civil servants um, who are working on these cases about how they should go about, for example, seeking due diligence. That's in place, as it should be. What there isn't is something which is publicly available to this parliament that says um, the government expects to uh, support private companies in certain circumstances. Here's the amount of financial capacity we have available for it. Here are the risks we're prepared to take on. And here are the strategic objectives that we would look to be achieving by doing that. And those strategic objectives might be about job preservation or future job creation. They might be about sustaining an industry that has got long-term potential um, within the Scottish economy. There could be other things. But in my view, it's really important that framework is there so that you other members of this parliament and people much more widely can understand why a company like Bifab receives support and a company like the one in your constituency or Mr Neil's doesn't. That's not to say they're the wrong decisions, but I think you should be able to understand the um, criteria that government is using to make them. I think the frustration comes, Auditor General, with the lack of transparency. It seems like a, a government decision and there is no justification for it. So your framework... Um, to be developed quickly would be very welcome, I think. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. <coughs> Good morning. Um, I'd like to change the topic slightly to your European Social Fund conclusions. Uh, your report discusses that there's been a pre-suspension of European Social Funds because the auditors, their auditors, identified, <laughs> and your words, serious deficiencies in the management and control system. Uh, now, these mirror similar deficiencies, apparently, from 2007 to 2013. So can you tell us what 
are these serious deficiencies? Who or which agency has dropped the ball here? And why wasn't it resolved after the last time? I'll ask Stephen to talk you through that. Thank you. Good morning. Um, the, maybe say briefly, the flow of funds in respect of this comes from the European Commission to the Scottish Government and, and on to the Scottish Government's partners and through to typically smaller uh, bodies across Scotland providing um, employment training and, and opportunities and, and so forth. The conditions that the European Commission uh, requires of effectively grant recipients are quite detailed, quite complex in some circumstances, but these are these are, are tested and set out in their legislation and then, um, then tested by the European Commission's auditors. When they did their audit, they identified the deficiencies that you refer to, Mr Kerr. Um, who are the bodies? There's a, a range of public bodies um, affected. One of the most notable and one that's disclosed by the Scottish Government in its own um, governance statement and accounts where they, uh, they too acknowledge the weaknesses here is Skills Development Scotland, uh, who's you know, one of the, the, the largest recipients of this grant funding. There are then uh, you know, a, a host of smaller public bodies, some local and indeed some local authorities um, alongside that in, in a larger category. But it's a, a range of public bodies. What the government have set out to do in, in correspondence and communication with the European Commission is to address these deficiencies by November and then a period of confirmation by the Commission's auditors that they have addressed the weaknesses and the government anticipates that the, the pre-suspension period will be lifted in early 2020. So just to be clear, just so I'm understanding you correctly, so it's the lead partners who have the serious deficiencies uh, and as a result of each individual lead partner or whichever ones are doing this, it, it filters up the chain and the European Social Fund is pre-suspended. If that's the same as was happening in 2007 to 13, why didn't the Scottish Government at the time say the lead partners are messing this up for everyone, uh, let's put in place a proper system to make sure it doesn't happen again. I, mean, I think that's certainly a, um, a line of inquiry that the committee may wish to explore further with the Scottish Government. Our understanding is that the, the remedial action that the government has taken to address the current problem before it um, is appropriate. You can see that the dialogue and, and specific uh, communication and additional training that they are providing to the grant recipients is, in their view, the steps that are taken, they need to take now to address the pre-suspension matters. Um, and if, as I suggested, that will be tested uh, when the Commission's auditors return uh, towards the end of this year and into early 2020. And, and just finally for me, the report says that, so at the moment, the lead partners are paying for the money that they haven't received. Uh, and I think there's been a contingent liability put in uh, the Scottish government's accounts. Um, so what happens if, if, there, if the pre-suspension is lifted, as you suggest it might be, uh, will the Scottish Government just fully reimburse the lead partners and just take the money and uh, put it out? Uh, but on the other hand, if the programme is fully suspended, then have the lead partners lost the money that they paid out during this pre-suspension? So it's maybe difficult for me to be definitive on that point um, in terms of, you know, what will happen to the, to the flow of funds? You're right, the first part of your question, that um, the, the public bodies um, haven't been receiving funding from the Scottish Government um, and they are funding the programmes uh, themselves for the time being. In the event that the pre-suspension suspension period is lifted and the flow of funds returns from Europe, the expectation is that that would trickle down to the bodies who, who haven't been in receipt of it for the time being. Um, but it's, it's very certainly a, a question that the government would, would be able to provide an answer on what their intentions are uh, on the assumption that the pre-suspension period is lifted. Thank you. We have a couple of questions on Prestwick Airport. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I think uh, if you ask the ordinary person in the street, and certainly if you ask any of the over 3,000 employees that work or are connected with Prestwick and the aerospace industry, uh, for some kind of justification about the Scottish Government's intentions, I think the answer would be obvious and clear. You know, obviously clearly the impact on jobs, the aerospace industries that are there, the strategic asset nature of the airport and the runway, the all-year all uh, ability of the airport to handle traffic and so on and so forth. For as a general, what what more is it do you think uh, could you, that you think are saying is required to make it clear to us as an audit committee and to the public, scrutinising the finances that, that, that we need that's perhaps missing? from this? 
Like you, I recognise the strategic importance of Presswick Airport. Um, I think when the government made the decision to purchase it, um, its, its rationale was much less about its scope as a commercial airport for passenger transport and much more about um, an aerospace hub uh, that could be used for the wider aviation industry in Scotland, and, and you've described some of that. I recognise that entirely. Um, what I said when I reported on that decision to um, purchase the airport, though, was that, um, as well as purchasing it at the time, the question of how the um, airport could achieve a financially sustainable future was the one that hadn't been answered at that point. Um, whether the, um, the income that can be generated from that sort of aviation work was sufficient to maintain it in the future, um, and if not, what the longer-term future might be for the airport itself. Uh, those questions are still unanswered, and I think they're another indication of why a framework around what the strategic objectives were, what the financial capacity was, and what the risk appetite was would have been helpful in putting that decision into context. Mm. Nobody, I think, wants to see Presswick closing. Equally, um, there has been nearly £40 million worth of Scottish Government loan provided, which has now been written down um, to a small fraction of that. Um, and it's not clear how the airport can become independently financially sustainable um, with the current business model sometime on from the original purchase decision by government. Mm -hmm. do, do you see, I mean, members were talking about the framework, do you, do you see there being an overarching framework that would give us the answer to all of these issues? Or do you see it more of of being on an individual case-by-case -case basis as these situations arise. I find it hard to imagine that there'd be an overall framework that would capture all of, all of this satisfactorily. It's bound to be um, judgment involved in each individual case. I think it wouldn't be a framework where you, you plug in a situation and a yes or no answer would come out the end. Um, I think for me those three things about the overall financial capacity, how much is, does government have available for this sort of support, the risk appetite that it has, and what are the strategic objectives beyond preserving jobs in the short term that it's trying to achieve. We all understand that the importance of jobs to people and communities, but those jobs need to be sustainable for the longer term and thinking about the way um, the intervention fits into the wider economic strategy, I think that framework would provide a useful link. And lastly, the, I mean, the, the spaceport potential at Presswick is incredible. I mean, it, it, could, it could deliver thousands of jobs down there. I know, and you've said in your report in paragraph 19 that Transport Scotland anticipates that a sale may be achievable by the end of 1920. Could you add any more to that, or is that as much as you're able to say at the moment? I'm not sure there's much more we can say, Stephen. No, it certainly it's a, it's a conversation we're content to have with our colleagues who audit uh, Transport Scotland and to track that, but I think, like the committee, we're just uh, monitoring progress and uh, awaiting the outcome. Thanks for that. And I'll start yeah. Presswick is undoubtedly strategically important, but apart from six Ryanair flights every day, it's largely a US military airbase. Um, it was purchased for a pound. There was £39.9 million pounds, uh, of loans put into it by the Scottish Government. Can you confirm how much of that loan has been written off? Um, it's been the value of the loan has been impaired by £33 million. Pounds. It's important to be clear that doesn't represent writing it off. It's writing down its value in the accounts, and it may ri rise again in future. But its current valuation is £6.9 uh, million. £6.9 million yeah. from a £39.9 million uh, loan. What do you think the likelihood of a sale is? As Stephen said before, we know the government is still in conversation, but I think it's been um, looking at the airport's future since it was purchased back in 2013, so we're now nearly six years on. Um, I think the important thing is for there to be a strategic view of the future of the airport and what government's role is in supporting that. Has there been any audit of the pricing policy of Pressbrook, particularly in relation to uh, the pricing of US military flights? Because there is a suggestion that there's uh, underpricing. There hasn't been an audit by me or the auditors I appoint because we don't appoint the auditors to the, the, co the company that owns Presswick Airport. It's a private company. Um, Transport Scotland is in dialogue with them um, about the government financial support and the, the future business case, um, but we don't have direct access to the airport's uh, financial accounts. So what the, pub what the public will see is uh, an airport that was bought for a pound, almost £40 million pounds of loans put into it, now an asset worth around six to seven uh, million pounds uh, being used for US military uh, flights. Um, at the same time, the US is imposing tariffs on Scottish products, for example, Scottish whisky of 25% uh, percent, uh, on Scottish whisky, and we're giving them cut price flights to land in Presswick, perhaps even for rendition flights uh, to take place in Presswick. 
Clearly, there's an inconsistency there. Shouldn't the Scottish Government be looking to up the prices on the US military air flights, if not scrapping them altogether? I think the questions you're asking are um, obviously policy questions and very political policy questions and therefore not ones that I can answer with, as, as Auditor General. Um, I think they're questions you may want to raise with government. But is it something, Auditor General, you can raise with Transport Scotland and Presswick around how we audit uh, and track the pricing policy? Because that obviously impacts on the public purse, obviously impacts on the value of the money that comes back into the public purse, then hoping to recoup some of that £40 million. Pound. For good reasons, um, my remit and the remit of the auditors I appoint excludes questions of policy. Um, the Transport Scotland auditor um, is and will continue to talk to Transport Scotland about the, the government's support and the government's objectives for the airport, um, but the, the very um, clearly policy-based questions, political questions that you're raising aren't ones that I can answer. They're for government and Transport Scotland to answer. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Very briefly. <coughs> Arising from that, uh, just a point of clarity for me. Auditor General, in response to Anna Sarwar, you said um, it's a private company that owns Prestwick Airport. Um, just for my clarity, so what do I as the taxpayer own um, and what is up for sale? Um, it's operated by, Press, by Presswick ha Airport as a holding company. Um, the government has pro it owns it but has set up a company to operate it and the government has provided loan funding to enable that company to keep operating since 2013. The value of that loan funding, as Mr Sawa said, um, was, has been £39.9 million provided. In the most recent government accounts, the value of that has been written down to by 33 million to 6.9 million to reflect expected losses against the value of the loans. Yes, but when you say, again, forgive me if I'm missing something, but you, you said that, that a company has been set up yes. uh, which owns which <coughs> owns all the assets of Presswick Airport, um, but that is a private company. That is not. Uh, what's the shareholding of that? Is that not? The taxpayer, or I, I'm not sure we I, I'm not sure we can give you the detailed answers now. I don't want to mislead the um, committee. We can certainly follow up after this. Stephen, is there anything you want to add at this stage? Um, <clears throat> the only uh, our understanding, um, and, and as the auditor general says, we'll we'll confirm this in writing, Mr. Kerr, is that the Scottish ministers are the sole shareholders of uh, of Presswick Airport Limited. Um, but they are not reflected in the accounts that you have before you today, that they are not part of the consolidation boundary, as it were, of the Scottish Government's accounts. And the same is true for companies like CalMac, um, Caledonia Marine Asset Limited, uh, Highlands and Islands Airports. They're all uh, private companies in which the Scottish ministers are the sole shareholder. Is that EU rules? Mr Neil. Sorry, just for clarification, <coughs> is that because of EU rules, or why, why is that the case? You know, I, I find it difficult that, um, in principle, to accept that you should be auditing something owned by Scottish ministers on behalf of the taxpayer. And, and we have um, responded to a request from the committee in the past to say there are anomalies around those companies and indeed Scottish Futures Trust, that none of those fall within the Auditor General's responsibilities, even though they're wholly owned by Scottish ministers. So whose decision is that? It's Scottish ministers' decisions. They've decided that, that it doesn't fall, fall within your remit. They've decided to set them up as uh, companies uh, limited by guarantee in that way, which fall outside my remit. But who decided that companies limited by guarantee fall outside? your remit? I think that goes back to the original um, founding legislation for what the Auditor General does and the interaction with Companies Act law. Right. So well, I thought I was being I thought I was being a bit slow, but it seems by design. So we've got just, just so I understand, we've got companies owned by Scottish ministers at taxpayers' expense that have been set up as private entities, so you can't audit them. I didn't say they were set up, so I can't no, them, audit them. But the, effect but the is result that is that you audit can't them. audit them. Yes. But they're owned by the taxpayer. They're owned by Scottish government ministers. We pay for them, and they're not within your jurisdiction to audit. Right. Okay, Bill Bowman. Maybe I can help with this because. Well, if you've got a question for the Auditor I do. General, Bill. Yes, okay, great. Of course. Um, you know, I, I should mention. I think since their name has come up this morning, I used to be a partner in KPMG, not no longer now. Um, I was trying. I, I read your report, which is very helpful, and all the questions we've had um, so far relate round these loans and investments. And I was trying to tie them back to the accounts. And the only sort of uh, area I could find is page 106, 
if anybody wants to look at that, which six, there's 136 pages that I, I got so far. Um, and it explains there that Scottish ministers are sole shareholder in CMAO, McBrain's, Islands and Islands, and Presswick Hold Co. Sole shareholders. And then it says these organisations are operated and managed independently and therefore do not fall within the consolidated portfolio. Now, counterintuitively, from the discussion here, is we're all a little bit surprised by that. And then we get a little bit of information about these organisations, three lines. And then they say these results are in draft as their accounts are yet to be published. So in these accounts, we're getting some draft information, unaudited presumably, for one year, no comparative, no reconciliation to draft before. Is this best practice in the way of disclosure? They're, they're not within the consolidated account boundary. So as you know, that means that they're not consolidated accounts. to the accounts. Yes, um, I, I understand um, the concern that you're raising. What I'm required to do as the auditor of these accounts is to um, value the government's direct stake in them and exposure to them, and that's been done. I think it would be helpful, and the committee's questions clearly um, reflect this, for there to be uh, a closer um, accounting and auditing relationship between these companies and the government's um, accounts. I mean, even if you follow their logic in giving this limited information, they then add IFAB at the bottom where they hold a 32.4% stake and say nothing about the results. I um, seem a gap. It, um, I, I, think it, I think it is a gap. I think it reflects the fact that um, loan funding was converted into an equity stake and that equity stake has then been written down in value. Um, but I think what, what we're seeing is that the Committee and Parliament have interest in greater transparency around this, which is what the report is calling for. Do you think there are any losses... Um, shall we say, hidden within this, this type of accounting? Very hard for us to say, I think. They clearly are, um, if you look at the companies listed there, they're quite different sorts of companies. Um, so uh, CMAO, Caledonian Maritime Assets, David McBrain and Highlands and Islands Airports are companies that have been up and running for a long time and have got specific roles. Uh, Prestwick was bought because it was in financial distress, was bought by government back in two, 2013 for a pound. We know from uh, my prior reporting to this committee and uh, the public, uh, the financial results that are in the public domain that the um, airport has required support from government to maintain it. So there are different categories within the uh, disclosures that are here um, and the transparency I think is important both in terms of understanding future potential uh, liabilities and being able to understand decisions government is making about providing financial support and strategic objectives for things like Presswick. Are any of these organisations relying on the Scottish Government to be going concerns or taking guarantees? Um, I think the, um, the, the loan funding which has gone into Presswick has clearly been critical to its ability to continue operating so far. We don't know how that expands into the future. Um, the other companies, I think we have no information that that's the case, and I'll ask Stephen again to talk you through what he's done as part of the audit work to get us to this stage. Ferguson. I don't know. Is Ferguson in here somewhere? I know. Um, it's not in because it's not a company in which the government has got an equity stake in that way. So where is the loan? Where is the loan? Stephen can tell you where it is in terms of the notes and disclosures that we've got. Thank you. I think um, it, in terms of Ferguson, um, just, just allow my just kind of recollection of the, which note in the accounts that the loan is, is captured. Uh, we understand that it's the government's intention around Ferguson um, to create a public body that, that um, won't be consolidated. So, so I think we're. I think that, um, that's broadly our expectation, Mr Bowman, that, that, that it will be, um, but I think it's something that, again, it would be a, a point for the government uh, to confirm um, its intention around the, the accounting for Ferguson as a, a, as a nationalised public body and then where that sits within um, the quite defined boundary that it, that it has uh, set up for which public bodies um, are in the Scottish Government consolidated accounts and then which public bodies are outside of that boundary. I think it shows the need for these whole of government accounts. I think you, I think that's that's right, and that's certainly something that is captured in detail um, in the report, not just in this year's Section 22 report, but, uh, but in last year, that the progress around the public consolidated accounts hasn't been as fast um, as we, or, or indeed I'm sure, I'm sure the committee uh, would have anticipated. That, that greater transparency of what um, Scotland 
uh, Scottish public bodies own and owe, there's a greater need for that level of disclosure and awareness uh, to be set out in the public consolidated accounts. And whilst the government has made some progress uh, during the year in, in sharing um, early indications uh, with its own audit committee, uh, and latterly over the course of summer uh, with ourselves, there's a need for that to be, uh, to, for the pace to pick up. And we expect that to, we've again recommended in the report that this needs to come through uh, towards the end of the 1920 financial year. Mr. Bowman, do you know what the delay on that has been? Because this isn't anything new that the Auditor General has been recommending. <laughs> commitment in 2016 to this committee that it would take it forward. Um, I think our sense is that the delay has been a priority placed on other areas of work. Um, there has been a lot of work going into um, new financial powers, uh, new tax powers and so on. Um, but as I say in my report, I think they are increasingly urgent given both the financial complexity and uncertainty governments facing and the range of um, interventions and support that it is providing to private companies. Mr Bowman, were you? Also, can I ask on the framework, if I can just try and tie up this section on loans and grants to private companies, um, the framework to decide, what is what has been the delay on that, Auditor General? Do you know? Because again, this isn't a new call of yours. I'm, I'm not sure the government has fully accepted the recommendation. Um, as I said in an earlier answer, it has provided more guidance to civil servants who are making decisions in individual cases, and that's useful. But it's not the same thing as having a framework about the government's overall approach to this support, um, the financial capacity, the risk appetite, and the outcomes that it's looking to achieve by doing so. So you're not sure that the government actually agrees with the need for a framework? We certainly haven't had a formal acceptance of that need in our conversations with the team responsible for it. Okay, perhaps that's something the committee can ask them. We'd like to um, scrutinise some other parts of your report. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. General, just to come back to what seems to be a recurring theme is financial planning. It's something that comes up in your reports quite frequently. And uh, again, you're talking here about the, the government having published a second medium-term financial strategy. You say it's a positive step, you say it takes it forward, but you think there's basic components that are not there. To what extent is the government constrained in producing a, a sort of a, a financial plan, financial strategies, when it, it doesn't really know what its funding is going to be year by year? I, I do understand the concern, but in a sense it's exactly that uncertainty that makes the longer term view more important. Um, the uh, budget process review group that I was part of um, recommended that the government, separate from the annual budget process, which, which clearly depends still to a large extent on the block grant coming from Westminster um, and will be affected by the timing of the UK <coughs> budget, which we still don't know, the purpose of the medium-term financial strategy is to give a longer-term view of the likely trends in revenues from um, taxation, the various sources the government now has powers over, and the um, direction of travel, indicative spending uh, patterns for uh, large areas like health, education and so on. Um, we know that the government has committed to protect health spending. It's possible, therefore, to, to provide some scenarios for what that might look like. It's got big commitments to early learning and childcare in line with its policy, setting out the, the large budget lines um, and the way in which they're expected to change um, over a five to ten year period is all the more important given the uncertainty there is about both levels of taxation and block grant funding from Westminster. I, I struggle a little bit about, about that concept when there's such a state of flux down in Westminster <coughs> where we're so reliant on, on getting our, our money from and their budget seems to almost change month by month as to what might or might not happen and what consequentials might or might not come to us and all sorts of things around that. And I know you might say, well, the Scottish Government might have to do, should be doing a worst case scenario or whatever, but is it actually not a big enough challenge doing a year by year budget in these circumstances at this time when the UK budget has no certainty around it? Um, I, I think what we're not looking for is just the worst case scenario, but a range of possible scenarios, the most likely, the, the best and worst pictures, if you like. Um, and it is possible to forecast what may happen to uh, 
tax revenues in Scotland um, to make assumptions about block grant and most of the spending um, on major areas is already either committed or will take some time to change. So giving that, that broad picture, indicative spending patterns and priorities, the government has prioritised health spending, what does that mean for the other, the other areas that aren't protected? Seems to me um, something which is all the more important because of the uncertainty you're talking about. Any strategy of that, support, of that sort is bound to have uncertainty in it, but that's the purpose of looking ahead and looking at possible scenarios and how the government would respond to them if they did materialise. Just, just again, coming back to your report here, you said in paragraph 35 and page 13 that overall the 2019 strategy, and this is, this is the, the second medium-term uh, financial strategy, you said that it represents a missed opportunity and a step backwards. Could you maybe give us a little bit more on that? Of course. Um, the 2018 strategy, the first medium-term financial strategy that the government published, um, did include spending scenarios for the Scottish Government's um, priority areas, and that was very welcome, a big step forward, and a, a, a good response to the recommendations of the Budget Process Review Group, which uh, Government and Parliament both accepted. That information was not included in the 2019 report. Um, I think the Government would say for the reasons that you have articulated the uncertainty that's around, uh, particularly at Westminster level, um, m my view is that that uncertainty makes it all the more important and that it would have been useful to have continued the um, good practice that was built into the 2018 strategy. Now, You've listed a number of areas where the strategy doesn't cover, such as indicative spending plans and priorities and so forth. Presumably you raised these emissions during the audit process. What was the Scottish Government's response? Um, we don't audit um, the strategies and plans in that way. What we do is to step back and look at the government's financial reporting, um, looking forward and back in that way. Um, we raised it in conversation with officials and then at the Scottish Government's Audit and Assurance Committee. Um, I think the government's response, as I've said, is, is very similar to the questions you're asking, that uncertainty makes it difficult. As Auditor General, my view is different, that the uncertainty makes it more important, and, and that's why I'm reporting to this committee in those terms. But you raised this. What was the response? As I say, the response was um, what we're hearing from you, that the uncertainty makes it uh, difficult to the point that it's not useful. Um, mm. My view is that it, it absolutely is difficult, but is all the more important to carry on doing that and to build on the good foundations that were laid in 2018. I think to have set out the direction of travel in 2018 and then not update it and build on it in 2019 is a step backwards, as I said in my report. In respect to the, to the audit function within the Parliament, who, who's the accountable officer for that? Within Parliament or within well, government? Well, the government. Within government. Um, the Chief Financial Officer is um, Gordon Wales and the Permanent Secretary is the accountable officer for government as a whole. Okay. Now, is there any clear guidance on the kind of information that you would expect a medium-term financial strategy to contain? I mean, you've touched on one or two mm -hmm. key items, such as, you know, the implications of uh, ring-fencing health and so on. But what kind of information would you expect to be in this strategy that's significantly not there? The um, report of the Budget Process Review Group um, pulled together good practice from uh, across the world that we could find around what uh, good financial management, strategic financial management looks like overall, and as part of that, the components of a medium-term financial strategy. Um, it obviously needs to cover both the revenue side and the expenditure side. It needs to be looking ahead for a longer period than the annual budget, and we suggested five to ten years as experience and expertise builds up. Um, forecasts for tax revenues with different scenarios uh, by the different um, tax bands, uh, tax streams that are available, um, and similarly for expenditure, um, what these, what expenditure patterns look like based on current policy, uh, current commitments that are built in for things like um, revenue financing and borrowing repayments, and government's priorities and how they might change those uh, current patterns of spending. It, it's not. It really is simply providing that, that overall picture of what the government's finances might look like, recognising the uncertainty, but doing the best to forecast what they mean for the future choices that government and then parliament will need to make. Now, if I picked you up correctly, I think you said that uh, you looked at other jurisdictions. 
for the, best practice. The Budget Process Review Group looked at other they jurisdictions. At yes. Did they look uh, at Westminster? Is there something we can learn from there? Are they doing those sort of projections? Um, the, the group did look at Westminster. Um, it also looked globally, and we found some good practice in, in countries like New Zealand in particular, where there's a great deal of transparency about the uh, government's finances and what they might look, look like in future. Um, the components of the medium-term financial strategy are there. We know that they're there because they were included in last year's strategy. It's more about um, giving effect to what the government started to do last year rather than about there being an answer somewhere else that the government hasn't already started to work on. My point here is that some of the things that were included last year were omitted this mm. year, and I think that's unfortunate. I guess, I guess coming back to doing comparisons, are Westminster doing that sort of forward planning that we're not doing here? Are they doing you know, a strategic plan in 5, 10, 15 years ahead? And uh, you know, simplistically, is there something we can just pick up from there as a process? The, the um, Westminster government has two elements. First of all is the spending review. Um, you're right, we don't know when the next Westminster spending review will happen. But also the Office for Budget Responsibility produces a medium-term fiscal outlook which does many of the same things and has done for a number of years now. I don't think the question is, is a, a disagreement about what should be in there. It's the content of the 2019 uh, fiscal strategy, um, which I'm commenting on, and specifically the fact that it contains less information than the 2018 um, fiscal outlook report did. Does it contain, sorry, keep coming back to the same thing, but does it contain the same level of information as in Westminster or less? <clears throat> Um, in overall terms, I think it contains less detail and very specifically the indicative spending plans and spending priorities are not in this year's Scottish fiscal outlook. Um, they are in the UK document and they were in the Scottish Government's document last year. So there, so there is a UK document that looks ahead 5, 10, 15 years? The OBR produces the fiscal outlook, as I've said. Okay. And ask Sarbor. Or I just wanted to turn to the financial management side of it, and in particular the uh, underspend uh, of the government. The report notes that there's a £778 million underspend. Can you just set out how that compares to, to previous years? Uh, and also, given the level of pressures on public services, uh, given this, the scale of, uh, of cuts in some public services, how the government is justifying a £778 million underspend? Um, we say in paragraph 7 that the um, underspend, as you say, in 2018-19 was £778 million. Pounds. In 2017-18, the total underspend was £84 million. Pounds. Um, the large areas of that are broken down in Exhibit 1 on page 6 of the report, and you can see where it comes through. Um, I think there's a couple of things to say. Um, one is that in overall terms, compared to the budget as a whole, it's still quite a small number. It's 778 million is obviously large in absolute terms, but against a budget of 37 billion, um, it's, it's a small figure. Um, and the resources can be carried forward through the Scotland Reserve and other mechanisms to future years. So I'm not concerned in that sense about the underspend per se. And I do say in the report that financial management operated well during the year. Yeah. I mean, there'll be lots of organisations across Scotland who have, have to strip back their um, services by tens of thousands and twenty of thousands of pounds. They, they might look at the £780 million and be a lot more concerned in terms of that figure than, than the, the bigger numbers. You mentioned the breakdown in terms of the by portfolio area in Exhibit 1. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions in particular around the education and skills budget and around the transport infrastructure and connectivity budget. Okay. Firstly, on the education and skills budget, there's a £297 million underspent. Just for clarification, none of that money is, that budget includes any kind of spending that goes into schools, so none of the PEF funding comes through that bit, or is that all in the local government? Most of it relates to accounting for student loans right. um, and the, uh, the the very specific accounting transactions that have to take account there. So most of it has no relation to schools. No relation. Okay. Yeah. So off that two nine seven, um, we obviously had the discussion about the report on on universities um, just last week and, and the financial pressure on universities. Um, we've obviously had a lot of discussion around the challenges facing Scotland's colleges uh, and budgetary pressures. We've also had lots of conversations at every audit uh, committee meeting around our workforce challenges 
identifying the skills, identifying the people, training them appropriately and getting them into uh, relevant areas. Surely seeing a figure of a gap of £297 million when we have such huge skills gaps in our economy and skills gaps in our public services uh, is unbelievable, isn't it? The um, underspend there is related to student loans and it's, a, it's not cash that would be available for other purposes such as investing in the workforce or in skills development in other ways. Um, I recognise the question but actually that cash wouldn't be available for, for so those that, purposes. That's all purely for underspend on, on loans so we'd expect to have higher payments in future years on the, on the loans? It, it's a very complex model for accounting for them and I'll ask Stephen if he can talk you through the impact of that. The... the the two hundred and seventy-five million pound underspend on, in respect of student loans <clears throat> broadly ref reflects the government's accounting treatment for the introduction of um, uh, new accounting standards around um, um, longer-term investment assets, of which student loans are categorised, and also the implications of um, changes in the, the, the length of repayment period, which reduced from thirty-five to thirty years. And then in addition to that factor, the, the change in income thresholds upon which uh, sh um, those with student loans were required to repay the loan. The government had anticipated part of this and had uh, provided budget cover for what it expected to be a significant impairment or a reduction in the value of that loan. It expected that most of that would have been applied in the 2018-19 accounts that you've had before you. When they did the review and then when we looked at that, we thought that part of that would have been better reflected related to impairments that should have applied in a number of years uh, prior to that. And that's what relates to uh, the 255 million of that figure, Mr. Sauber, ought to have better been reflected in years prior to 18-19. So the full underspend that reflects the fact that the government had allowed budget cover, but in conversation with ourselves, it felt actually this was better reflected in the 17-18 accounts, which are the most up-to-date accounts uh, available to do so. It's clear that this money is not available for spending on public services. Do you want yep. to go on to transport? And just about tr transport, so the £366 million, I note in the report that, that uh, a lot of that money is rollover money, so it's money that's committed that will be spent in the future. Off that rollover, how much of the 366 is rollover money? And do you know what that's for? Do you have a breakdown of that? I think we need to come back to you to give you the, the detail. There's two elements. One is, as you say, projects deferred to future years. Yep. The other is lower than anticipated unitary payments for revenue finance projects, things done under the NPD model, for example. So I'd prefer to write to the committee to give you the information rather than... So just like you've helpfully provided the, the clarification on the 297 and how much of that would actually have been available for additional services, is there a similar figure for the 366? Um, we can give you that. I don't think I've got it here at... I would would it, it be to a similar extent, though, as the, as the 297 in the education and skills budget? Um, no, uh, we're saying that um, most of it is um, projects deferred to future years or under uh, lower than expected unitary payments. As I say, I'd prefer to write to the committee than give you figures Great. that aren't accurate. Uh, yeah. uh, just one final response. question sorry, on the, on the uh, underspenders. There is a perception, at least, that the, the government keeps back a slush fund mm -hmm. for any issues that might come up through the day or indeed a slush fund to buy off a budget deal in, in future years. Is there a slush fund and what's the scale of the slush fund for the government? Um, I think it, the, within the fiscal framework, the government is still required to set a, a balanced budget. It can't, in normal circumstances, borrow for um, revenue purposes, uh, so it has to set a balanced budget, unlike the UK government. That means its financial management will generally lead, lead to an underspend, and we've seen that over a number of years now. Um, having said that, I have reported in the past about the lack of transparency around some of the ways in which money is carried forward from one, one year to another, including things like the balance on the non-domestic rate account. Yep. Um, and I bring that to this committee's attention when I'm concerned about it. I'm not concerned about this underspend. I think the, the explanations are clear to us and we've summarised them here. The government could give you more information and the Scotland Reserve provides some scope for carrying money forward from one year to, to another so that it's not lost. Excellent. Thank you. Coffee. Convener, it was really in the same issue there that, that's raised by Anis Sarwar. Sometimes you look at figures in a variation table and you're, you're like a rabbit caught in the headlights. You think, well, there's a big variation. There's a story to tell there. But the explanation you gave, Auditor General, about the underspend in education and skills, it's quite clearly explained in page 67 of the consolidated accounts. But what I wanted to ask you was it's quite a technical explanation that about the student loans. Is there any way you can simplify that kind of issue for us 
in your audit, future audit reports to make it a little bit clearer because your immediate reaction is, oh my goodness, there's £300 million that could go into a slush fund, as Mr Sarwar referred to there, but that's actually not the case, is it? Um, it, the, it's not the case. The accounting for student loans is particularly complicated, but we will do our best in future to um, explain it to the committee in as simple terms as we can manage. Right. See, in terms of in terms of things that are perhaps higher allocations than were ultimately needed, and lower than anticipated expenditure outturn, when those kinds of events occur, is that money that can be taken and used elsewhere? And does the, do the accounts clearly show the difference? Because clearly that money can't be used for any other purpose. But I would, I would ask you that if there are okay. items in this sort of category where you've perhaps got higher allocations that are ultimately needed, surely that money could be invested elsewhere in other services? Um, I say in the report um, very clearly that um, financial management operated effectively during the year. Um, government is actively looking for, bless you, looking for... Um, the, those areas where expenditure may be higher or lower than, expended, than expected and uses the, particularly the autumn budget revision to make changes where that's required. Um, that's entirely appropriate. It does now have the ability to carry underspends forward through the Scotland Reserve to future years um, and that is a useful budget management mechanism. Um, as I said in response to Mr Sarwar's question where I'm concerned that there is a less transparency than there should be about that approach, I, I have reported it and will do, do so in future. But it's a big and complex budget, as you know. Um, the government does have to set a balanced budget. I think overall the underspends are not unreasonable. Um, and my conclusion is that financial management worked well. It's the transparency that I think could do with more um, attention, particularly the longer term question of the financial strategy that government's pursuing. Okay. Okay. Bill Bowman. Thank you, Convener. In your report um, and your conclusion, paragraph 57, the last bullet, you say the Scottish Government should ensure its Audit and Assurance Committee provides greater scrutiny and challenge to better support the advice and assurances given to the Permanent Secretary and operates in line with good practice. Now, if I was on that Audit Committee, I'd probably go, ouch, at that comment. <coughs> who, who is on the committee and what are they doing wrong? Um, there are, uh, it's made up of non-executive directors, and Stephen, um, who attends every meeting, can give you a bit more information about them. There were four new, new non-execs appointed during the year, which we welcome. Um, we have reported, though, in the past and this year, that the amount of challenge and scrutiny of management could be stronger in order to provide the assurance to the Permanent Secretary that she needs to be able to manage the organisation well and to sign off her governance statement here. Um, it is a sensitive issue, as you recognise, but I think it's an important one. Stephen, would you like to say a bit more? Yes, yeah, so, um, as the Auditor-General says, <clears throat> the members of the committee um, are all non-executives uh, appointed by the Scottish Government. Um, it's currently chaired by um, a partner in an accountancy firm, and with other members being... Um, uh, Chief executives from uh, third sector uh, charities, um, those with in experience in industry, and they've recently appointed some other new members, some of which reflect the government's increasing scope uh, and responsibilities. So they brought in some uh, tax expertise uh, from the new members. I think the recommendations in the report, I think there's two things in particular <coughs> that we've uh, had conversation with the, with the committee about the need for it to produce an annual report um, on its activities and also the need, um, as audit committees uh, do uh, when they follow the government's own audit committee guidance, is to undertake an annual review of its own effectiveness. Um, and that's something that we understand that the Scottish Government Audit Committee uh, is committed to doing, taking forward. Are the names of these individuals in the financial <coughs> statements? Yeah, yes, they are, Mr Bowman. They're, they're uh, identified under the um, remuneration uh, section of the report uh, where they, they set out the, those members that are part of the corporate board. Um, and, the, and the membership of the corporate board flows into membership also of the Scottish Government Audit and Assurance Committee. So when you discuss with them, I mean, where does your actual comment come from? Do you feel they don't really have a grasp as to what's going on? No, I, 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 I don't think it, uh, we would say that, they don't, um, that that applies. I think what, what we've seen in the round is an improvement in the Scottish Government's um, internal governance arrangements um, over the course of the past 12 months. We particularly point to the, the, the fact that we've just uh, covered that they brought in some new skills and expertise and appointing new additional uh, non-executive members. 
We've also seen and commented positively um, on the arrangements for the Director General um, assurance functions, almost like a second tier layer of audit committees um, that they have. We've seen some you know, additional scope and challenge. What we would say about the Scottish Government uh, Audit and Assurance Committee itself is that there is more scope for that level of challenge to be replicated in its own meetings that we're starting to see at the second tier um, assurance meetings. And we think some additional structure around that, such as the annual review of effectiveness and the annual reporting, will you know, better reflect and kind of and give them the platform to do just these things. So the things that we've honed in on and you've honed in on, like these loans, was that on their agenda? So these topics, I think, are more typically covered at the assurance, the second tier assurance meetings. And whilst they're on the risk register and the, the materials available, it's the type of topic that we think there's more scope for conversation and the Scottish Government's own audit committee. So you're saying the audit committee didn't discuss these issues? I think it would be wrong for me to, to say exactly that. I think in, in the round we're seeing that there's more scope for conversation on, on key items such of, of development, rather than, because um, the, go the government's been really clear in terms of an escalation process that is the role of the Scottish Government, as, uh, its own audit committee. But the, the depth of conversation that in the matter that you're referring to more typically takes place um, in the Director General uh, assurance meetings. Um, and there's no question that there's an awareness understanding across all those around the table of such matters, but we think there's place for a, a, a conversation in itself to happen in the Scottish Government's own audit committee. I think you're being very diplomatic. Well, I, I, Mr Boyle's <laughs> given his answer to the best of his knowledge. I trust that's the case, so I think that's fair enough. Um, Alex Neil. Just two quick supplementaries to that. First of all, who appoints the non-executive directors of the Scottish Government? <coughs> is it the Permanent Secretary or is it the First Minister? Uh, and do these appointments fall within the scope of the Public Appointments Code and the Commissioner? So that's my first question. And my second question is, uh, Stephen, I think I picked you up right when you said the Audit Committee of the Scottish Government, the main Audit Committee, is chaired by somebody from one of the big um, accountancy companies. Is that right? That's not quite correct, Mr Neil. The, the chair of the Scottish Government um, uh, Audit Committee, um, uh, they are a partner in um, a smaller, a mid-tier accountancy firm, so it's not one of the big four. Right, OK. But is there any potential conflict of interest there? Um, I, I would say no, and I think and I think the reason for that is there's a very clear um, code of, of declaration um, of conflicts of interests uh, for um, for senior civil servants and also for uh, for board members. Um, and this, the, the first part of your question about who appoints them, they, they do indeed follow the the public appointments model um, that all um, boards of governance across the Scottish uh, public sector follow, and that similarly applies to the Scottish Government Assurance. So they are ministerial appointments? Um, to, to all intents and purposes, they, f they follow that model. Yeah, but are they ministerial appointments? I, I, I think that's my assumption, Mr Neil, but if I'm, I'm incorrect, I'll come back to the Can you check and let us know, please? I, okay. Of course. I can honestly say I held four government positions and I never came across any of them at any time. Have there been more over the last few years, Mr Boyle? Is that something that you have picked up? Just to clarify, you know, more the, the committee has grown in size, so the Scottish Government has appointed more non-executives uh, to boost its capacity um, over the past 12 months. Okay, thank you. Um, I, Eight, I think. Eight. Yeah. Right. And you're going to supply us with the details and, and the answers to the questions of who they are. Uh, the, the individuals are actually available on the Scottish Government's website, but right. we can certainly summarise that for the committee as well if it would be Great. useful. Thank you. Yeah. And is there a stipend attached to the non-executive director posts? There is. Um, the fees for 18-19 are shown on page 49 of the annual reports and accounts here. Um, it's uh, for the chair, ten to fifteen thousand pounds is the banding. For members, five to ten thousand pounds is the banding per annum. Per annum. Okay. Do members have any further points for the Auditor General and her team on the consolidated accounts? Okay. Can I thank you very much indeed for your evidence this morning? I'm going to suspend until ten thirteen for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Item 3 is the Section 22 report on the 2018 Audit of Social Security Scotland. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Mark Taylor, Audit Director, Gemma Diamond, Audit Director, Kirsty Ridd, Senior Auditor, Performance Audit and Best Value, all from Audit Scotland. Auditor General, I understand you have an opening statement. Thank you, Convener. Briefly, this report brings to your attention the appointed auditor's qualified opinion on the regularity of Social Security Scotland's 2018-19 accounts. These are the first accounts for this new body. It's important to be clear from the outset that the auditor has given an unqualified opinion on the information reported in the agency's financial statements, which means he's content that they show a true and fair view and follow all relevant accounting standards and rules. The qualification relates specifically to the rules under which the agency's carer's allowance expenditure is incurred. The auditor has qualified his opinion in relation to the regularity of carer's allowance expenditure because there is not enough evidence to determine whether this expenditure was in line with the relevant le legislation. Carer's allowance is being delivered by the DWP, the Department for Work and Pensions, on the Scottish Government's behalf through an agency agreement. This means the agency relies on the DWP's estimates of error and fraud, which have not been updated for over 20 years. The caseload and expenditure on carer's allowance have increased significantly since then. The estimate is also calculated only at the UK level and therefore does not reflect any Scottish specific influences. Due to these factors, the auditor has concluded that this is not a reliable estimate of current levels of errors, error and fraud in carers' allowance in Scotland. The agency is using different delivery methods to administer the carers' allowance supplement and the Best Start Pregnancy and Baby Payment, <coughs> and these benefits are not affected by the same regularity issue. It is nonetheless important for the agency to understand the underlying levels of error and fraud in the reserve benefits that affect people's eligibility for, for Scottish benefits and the impact of this for the Scottish system. I've also reported on the agency's wider approach and processes for managing error and fraud within the Scottish social security system. These are critical for making sure that people get the benefits they're entitled to. The agency has established core processes and policies, but these are at an early stage of development and there's much more to be done. It will become increasingly important for the agency to have effective and well understood arrangements for managing error and fraud, as the range and scale of benefits it's responsible for increase over the next few years. The value of expenditure will increase substantially, and the risk of error and fraud will increase as the agency takes on responsibility for benefits that are paid on a regular basis and that involve complex determinations of eligibility. As always, convener, we're happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. I'm going to ask Colin Beattie to open questioning for the committee. Thank you, well, General, just like a little clarification on the point you raised there before I actually go to the question. And this is in connection with the uh, carer's allowance expenditure. Now, in paragraph uh, uh, five of your uh, report, you say that the Controller and Auditor General of the National Audit Office has qualified the regularity <coughs> opinion on the w DWP's accounts for the last 30 years due to the levels of error and fraud in them. Now, presumably, for that portion, you rely on the National Audit Office to do the audit of the carers' allowance for the piece that they, that, that's handled by w, DWP? Sort of. Um, we, we do our own audit of the accounts of Social Security Scotland. And within Social Security Scotland, there um, is this year a sum of a little more than 150 million for carers' allowance. And in order to um, reach an audit opinion on that, the independent auditor, Mark Taylor beside me, has to look at the arrangements which Social Security Scotland has in place for um, estimating the level of fraud and error. Now, in the, because of the way that benefit's delivered, their estimates come directly from DWP, and we do no further work to look at the way in which, that they, which they are being calculated. Uh, because it's 20 years out of date, um, and because of the amount of change in the population and the expenditure on that benefit since then, uh, the auditor concluded that it wasn't a reliable estimate in Social Security Scotland's accounts. So there, there is a relationship with DWP and the National Audit Office, but it's the auditor's own determination based on Social Security Scotland. Scotland's accounts. Fair enough, but given the history of the National Audit Office over 30 years uh, qualifying uh, their opinion on this because of the, the levels of error and fraud, is it likely then it's going to be a Section 22 every time from yourselves as well? 
Not necessarily, and I'll ask Mark to talk you through why that's the case. Yeah, but, uh, thank you, Auditor General, and uh, thank you, Mr Beattie. The, the, we, we set out in the report there's essentially two models for uh, paying benefits. There's the pre-existing UK model, which is really based on underlying ed eligibility criteria. And as we set out in the report, if uh, individual payments are paid to people who are not eligible, those are irregular, effectively. And in uh, the Scottish model, which applies to Best Start Grant Pregnancy Baby Payments and some of the other benefits that will come along behind, uh, there's, the rules are set out in legislation that if a determination is made, in other words, the agency decides that somebody is entitled, then that payment has to be made. And therefore, the rules apply differently in those two circumstances. In terms of what it will mean for us in the future, we'll have to work out what the mix of those two things are. And that's quite dynamic as, as benefit responsibilities transfer from UK to Scotland. Uh, and uh, Scottish uh, Government takes on responsibility for uh, some of the benefit streams that uh, uh, DWP will continue to process, and we'll have to make judgments around that. The, the, the underlying issue for us is to bring to your attention the non-compliance with the rules, but also, irrespective of which of those two models apply, error and fraud is something that the agency needs to understand and manage to, to make sure that it's managing that appropriately. So there is a... a, a a technical qualification issue, but behind that there's the, the set of issues about how well is the agency able to ma manage the error and fraud that is now in Scottish expenditure. Well, given the concerns about error and fraud, uh, your report on paragraph 37 says that to support ease of access, less stringent evidence requirements have been adopted by the agency, uh, such as not requiring the same documentation to evidence a person's identity and residency as in relation to other benefits, such as housing benefit, and by accepting photocopies. How, is that adequate? As we say in the previous paragraph, in paragraph 36, the, the government has prioritised um, both um, dignity, fairness and respect and people's ease of access to the benefits they're entitled to in delivering the new social security system in Scotland. That's a policy choice and we understand it. Having taken that approach, though, it obviously does have implications for the way it goes about um, safeguarding public money. Both of those things need to be managed, um, and it needs to understand the impact of the sorts of decisions it's taken that you've just described on the possibility of error and fraud, and make sure that its safeguards and its investigatory, investigatory capacity are both um, sufficient to recognise the inherent risks of error and fraud in a social security system that's prioritising access. But if the DWP are having levels of error and fraud with more stringent uh, requirements, relaxing them, will that lead to higher levels of error and fraud here? As Mark said, um, error and fraud is inherent in a social security system, um, and any system is having to balance <coughs> people's ability to access the money they're entitled to and protecting public money. Um, the, DW, the, the problem with the DWP's estimate for carers' allowance, which is where we started uh, this report, is that the estimates are now 20 years out of date. Um, and uh, that's why we concluded that we can't rely on them in relation to the rules for Scottish benefits. The Social Security Agency needs to be rapidly now developing its own, own approach to managing error and fraud and making sure that it has um, estimates that we can use in our audit work to come to a conclusion about regularity and the overall financial statements of the agency. Just to clarify, you're saying that the DWP's estimates of error and fraud are t based on 20-year-old data? For carer's allowance, yes. For carer's allowance. Yes. Okay. Still looking at the question of... Uh, <coughs> security around this. Your report indicates the agency has not yet developed clear guidance on the meaning of ordinarily resident, which seems fairly basic. It's a core criteria for benefits. Um, do you know whether the agency is making progress in this? Because, you know, it's fairly important. It, it is central to that determination of people's entitlement. Gemma, can I ask you to pick that up? Um, throughout the audit process, we had um, a range of conversations with the agency about residency. The main assumption that the agency uses for um, if somebody is resident in Scotland is, is postcode, so that if they have a Scottish postcode, um, they are resident in Scotland. And that, you know, that is a sensible assumption um, to make. What, when we were looking at it, particularly for the best start grant pregnancy and baby, that it's really important for both the people who are implying and also those... Um, 
um, people within Social Security Scotland who are making those decisions to be really clear about what entitlement means so there should be more guidance about actually what does ordinarily resident mean rather than just be there being an assumption about a postcode. So what progress are they making? What methods are they using to, to determine this residency? So that was a recommendation that we put in our annual audit report and they have committed to taking that forward to look at. Timescale? Um, let me just check in our annual audit plan, sorry. If it's such a critical criteria to have. Sorry, I would, I would just check I'd that hope information. Doing it fairly quickly. Yeah. Yes, sorry, I think, sorry, I'm just yes. to find that, sorry, thank you. Okay, yeah. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener, good morning. Um, uh, a quick clarity from something that Colin Beattie just said, Gemma Diamond, you, you said that um, the criteria for being ordinarily resident, they use the postcode. So does that mean that by having a postcode in Scotland, I could, I can, I am ordinarily resident for the purposes of claiming certain benefits? Is that right? That's a, yes, that's the main way of assessing residency at the moment, yes, postcode. Thank you. Uh, sticking with this error and fraud, uh, you note in your report at uh, paragraph 39 that the agency doesn't have an approach to estimating error and fraud for the benefits it delivers and those that it's going to be uh, delivering in the next few years. So do you have any sense of when that approach might be developed? And perhaps more crucially, will it... Uh, have such an approach by the time other benefits come on board, such as the Scottish Child <coughs> Payment? So um, I think what we set out in the report is a kind of basically saying that the agency within the first seven months has really been putting the building blocks in place of its error and fraud team um, and it has got plans for growth within that team so there's a number of strategies that it's put out today in um, looking at its investigations code of practice for example being the, the initial um, places that they have started we know that they are looking at how best they can estimate error and fraud levels both within the expenditure limit themselves and also um, how it relates to um, error and fraud that's already within the DWP system, some of those qualif qualifying benefits that people will be on. So that's an approach that they will be developing over the next year and we'll um, be monitoring that throughout the audit process. So just to absolutely pin that down, so you would expect over the next year that that approach will be crystallised within the next 12 months? We would certainly expect them to be further forward with that approach over the next year, yes. Further forward, Gemma, come on. Uh, when will this be done? Because uh, it's obviously, as Colin Beattie quite rightly points out, th this is pretty crucial, uh, that we have an approach to error and fraud. So when will they be getting this done, do you think? We haven't had a firm date from the agency on that. We will be monitoring it over the year in terms of the progress they make against that. Thank you. That's something perhaps we can pursue. Thank you. Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Chair. I just had a couple of questions. One around uh, late payments of the Carers Living Supplement. Um, the report um, states that the most recent scan from the DWP in April 2019 saw that in April 2018 and October 2018 there was people that should have got a payment but didn't get a payment. Do we know the extent of, of late payments? I don't, I don't think we can give you that information. It may be something that you want to follow up with the agency. Right. But, but it's significant enough for it to be noted as a concern in the report? Um, what we do you know is that all payments were made so that each month it's, it, it scans back to make right. sure that anybody who missed a payment was pa is paid in the next payment month so we have assurance that all payments were, were processed through. Great, so that may be something we can, we can take away separately. The, the other one was, um, as you could probably guess, I'm going to ask a question about workforce. Um, the report also states around the um, order of Error and Fred team sorry, that there is uh, 17 current full-time officers. And the plan is to wrap that up to 47 by the end of March 2020. And then when we have a fully functional agency, to up to 190 full-time equivalent staff. What level of skills and expertise are going to be required to, to fill those posts? Do we think that train is in motion and it'd be a realistic um, expectation that we will recruit those numbers and find those individuals? We're obviously always talking about a snapshot at a point in time, um, but Gemma and Kirsty, I think, can give you a sense of progress that the agency is making since the 31st March date. Um, so what we do know in terms of um, the people that are in post at the moment is that they have got um, 
very highly skilled people in those posts, so people have a background in, in error and fraud um, and are qualified in their, that area to take that forward. Um, in terms of actual progress and where they are at the moment, I couldn't give you an, an exact figure against that. That would be something um, to check with the agency, but certainly, again, we'll be monitoring that throughout the year in terms of their progress against that, what any um, shortfall means and if, they, if they can't get in the skills and capacity that they require. But certainly in terms of overall agency recruitment, they haven't seen the same issues in getting people into the agency as the Scottish Government mm. programme has um, for, for um, implementing the powers. And just one last question, Chair. You mentioned they have a background in error and fraud. Is that taking people from the DWP and, and moving them over to the, the new agency? Is it looking at people that perhaps worked in the banking sector around error and fraud? and recruiting from there, or do you think there would be a, a direct approach to try and get people from college, university courses, etc., skilled and trained up and into the department? Or the agency, sorry. So I, I don't have um, all the details of that. What we do know um, that across the agency, there's a wide range of backgrounds coming into the agency. So there are absolutely people coming in from DWP um, and other um, UK departments. There are coming, people coming in from the, the retail sector. Um, so they are they are absolutely recruiting from a, a wide range. But in terms of the detail and the forward narrative, I don't I don't have that. Thank you. Again, I think that's probably a question we could raise with the agency themselves. And Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, the second of your key messages is about error and fraud, and given the th um, discussion earlier, can you tell us uh, something about the Audit Committee? Who's, who's on that? How are, they, how are they doing? It's their first year. Are they really getting in about it? Mm -hmm. Mark, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, we, 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 uh, in terms of our overall assessment of the Audit Committee this year, we've reported that uh, they provide a good level of scrutiny. Uh, there's four members of the audit committee. They come from diverse backgrounds, and their names are in the the, the, the accounts of the uh, the uh, social security agency itself. And they come from a range of uh, audit professional backgrounds, uh, civil service experience, and indeed third sector. Uh, and and and, and cl bring the client perspective of that. Four members on the audit committee, and we've we've reported that they provide a good level of scrutiny in that first year, Mr. Bowman. Could you give us an example of what they've maybe done to? keep the organisation on its toes? Uh, I, I, I think that we are content that some of the big issues that are featured in this report and uh, are featured in our wider reporting have been very much the stuff of their conversations in, those, in their meetings. Uh, for example, the, the, the error and fraud issue has featured uh, in discussion uh, at that audit committee. I mean, to go back to Mr Neil's questions about who appoints them, do you, do you know that? So it's the same, it's the same, same appointment process that, 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 that all of the public appointments are, and we'll, we'll pick that detail of that and, and up in that answer. Essentially, that is managed uh, by the agency itself in terms of the sort of people that it's looking for at that kind of uh, level, but they use the wider appointment process in order to access those people. I mean, I don't have the financial statements here in front of me. Are they on the same sort of remuneration bands as the... Yes, so there's, a, there's, there's a basic, basically a standard remuneration package for non-executives across government and in the same set of bands. And without also having the number figures in front of me, it would be very similar in that uh, 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 five to ten range in terms of the, the, the basic stipend for a non-executive. Okay, thank you. Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Auditor General, can I refer you to paragraph 31 and 2 in your report? It's about the system design for component parts of the delivery, software delivery. As you know, the from memory, the, the, the cost of the social security transformation is about £300 million in the IT component, and that's about £200 million. It's a substantial amount of the entire transformation cost. Uh, and the last meeting I think we had, we were told the, well, the IT systems were all on track. This, there's a ref reference in here to, to tell us that there are some operational weaknesses in the core case management system which is raising a risk of error and fraud and they're now adopting some manual processes in the meantime. Could you give us a little flavour of what's going on here and whether there are any further concerns other than what you've, yeah. you've said? I'll ask Gemma to give you a bit more detail. I'll preface it though by saying we clearly don't want to say too much about the weaknesses identified in a, in a public setting, but Gemma can give you a sense of, of where that fits in the IT development. Absolutely. So these um, weaknesses were picked up by management um, themselves um, and they have put additional controls in place, um, which are manual controls um, to um, mitigate those weaknesses. Um, what we know about this, the system design, and, and it has been kind of rehearsed through um, previous um, meetings and sessions with the committee, is it's absolutely being built in, a, in an incremental way. 
um, and prioritising the safe and secure delivery. That means that um, essentially decisions and about priorities are made in terms of what essentially makes a deliverable product. Um, and what we recognised in the um, Section 23 report um, earlier in the year was that the agency needs to have more <laughs> prominence in those decisions about what is a what what. Um, should be a priority in the initial s in system design. And I think what we're seeing is um, an example of that where um, greater priority needs to be given to some of the actual operational controls within the system in the first instance for that initial service design. Now, what we do know is that those um, essentially design fixes of, of going back into the system to, so that the system will be improved for these areas and manual controls are in place in, in, the, in the first instance until they are improved. But with greater agency involvement in some of those decisions, hopefully some of those operational weaknesses will be fixed in the initial service design. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know you can't go into too much detail on a, on a subject like that, but just in terms of the software development and whether it's robust enough to manage potential situations, is there any indication that, that that's being fixed soon or is there always going to be a manual element to this, do we think, to, to do this kind of spot checking, do you think? Are we completely relying on the software to pick out potential problems or is there always a manual process that goes over the top of that too? So some of the weaknesses were around about audit trails and um, system alerts for duplicate payment, that, those kind of areas. And again, the manual controls can um, mitigate an element of that. Obviously, a system control is more efficient and more effective um, at that. Um, so it would be appropriate to ask the agency where they are now with um, kind of fixing those within the system. That's certainly, again, something we will pick up through the audit process over the next year and into the system design for future benefits as well. Mm -hmm. And are you, are you keeping track of the whole software development kind of components that are to be delivered for the entire project? Yeah, who's, who's keeping track of the pace of that for, for us or for you? So that's something that we look at um, throughout the year. We, obviously, there was a Section 23 report earlier this year, um, and we are following that up um, with with future performance audit work. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'd like to ask about the financial plan, because, Auditor General, you said that the agency has no long-term financial plan in place. Given how much money they're going to be spending, that's quite worrying. Can you say a bit more about that, please? I'll ask Mark to pick that up. It's something that's covered in more detail in the annual audit report, so Mark can give you more flavour of that. Uh, so, so we recognise that the agency is a new body, and I think one of the fundamental challenges for the agency is as it grows through time, what's the planning that goes around that in terms of uh, uh, the finances and the workforce? And there's a clear read across from that to the discussion we've had previously with the committee about where government is around that and, and the round and the, the way in which planning works and the way in which the, uh, the approach has been taken to that incremental uh, planning. And we've been clear our views about the need for more transparency about what the overall cost is and uh, some of the detail around some of those plans. And that then translates, of course, to the challenge for the agency as well. Uh, we've reported locally to the agency, and they recognise the need that as they uh, understand uh, what's in store for them effectively, and they're engaged in that process, that they build that into their own plans. In the round, there's absolutely that need for improved planning, improved insight as to when those resources are required, when that recruitment needs to happen, uh, and, and, and when the agency needs to put in place, but really recognise the interplay between what the agency can do and what government can do. But absolutely, in the round, there's a need to improve that area. Mr Taylor, when would you expect a new agency such as this, given the extent of their spending, to have that long-term financial plan in place? So very much we will be looking as we enter into our next year's audit that there's made development around that. And okay. uh, again, if there, there's not a plan that we can point to, that we will be raising that as a concern in, in the next uh, uh, annual audit. So you would look over the course of your audit next year for it to be in development, when would you expect it to be complete? So again, we would highlight as a concern if that wasn't completed in the next year. Okay, so a year from now. Okay, thank you. Can I also ask about the restructuring? Because we know in terms of the lead leadership team that there's been a bit of restructuring and I think the Chief Executive has brought in three new senior people to support him. 
Um, now, leadership and leadership teams is something that this committee has been concerned about for, for a long time and we've discussed before. Are you confident that this leadership restructure is the right thing to do and that they have sufficient skills to get the right people in place? So we absolutely understand uh, what the agency is trying to do, which is basically to scale up as it grows. We understand the need for that. I don't think we're in a position to provide a view on the competency of the leadership. I think what we do is through our audit is we identify the concerns, we identify how well how well the, the organisation has been run, and we've captured that across the, the range of the reporting that we've got. So we've no specific concerns about it at the moment. It's it's looking ahead. It's increasingly challenging, and we'll place a, place a close eye on how the agency is performing in, in relation to those challenges. Okay. Do members have any further questions or comments on this report? Okay. Can I thank you all? Oh. Sorry, Colin. Sorry. Colin Beattie. There was just one small thing which was following on from the comments that I uh, was making earlier, and it was about the DWP estimates for errors and frauds. And I'm looking at paragraph 22 here, where they're looking at uh, error and fraud levels in the BSG qualifying benefits ranging from 3.9 to 8.6 per cent, presumably depending on which benefit they're talking about. Now, the carer's allowance, they're saying, is 5.5. These seem awfully high as a percentage of an awful lot of money. Um, they are relatively high. Um, as we've said a couple of times, there's an inherent risk of both error and fraud um, in a system which is relying on paying out uh, sums of money to individuals. Um, that risk increases with the, the scale of the benefit, the amount of money involved, the complexity of the determination of whether someone's eligible or not, and how frequently the payments are made. So people's circumstances may change between payments that are happening monthly, whereas a one-off payment is less prone to that. It's those sorts of factors that the agency needs to understand for itself in relation to the Scottish benefits and to make sure that it's matching whatever decisions it takes about benefits and how they're delivered, how eligibility is assessed and what checks and balances it needs to have in place to make sure that while people are getting what they're entitled to, public money is also being protected. That's I realise these estimates matters. are you know, 20 years, based on data, 20 years old. For carer's allowance only. For the carer's allowance only. <laughs> And 5.5 per cent. I mean, that's millions of pounds as far as as far as Scotland's concerned. Uh, I'm surprised it's so high. I would have thought a fraction of a percent. I, I'm not sure there's very much we can add to um, no. what you've said at this stage. Um, as you said earlier, DWP's accounts have been qualified for 30 years. None of us want Social Security Scotland to be in that position. And more, more importantly, we want public money to be protected and people to get what they're entitled to. It's why the approach to fraud and error is so important at this point in its development. Okay, can I thank you all very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I now close the public part of this meeting as we move into private session.